If you're ready to start, stand to your feet, everybody. I see. Mr. Betty Jones, Jones, stop talking to class and turn She's around. <laughs> Seriously, how many glad to be in the house of God tonight? Yeah. I can tell you I've been blessed already by that young lady. Uh, just uh, the conversation for a few minutes, the fire that was on me. I've been blessed all year. She don't know it from the testimony I heard about Jews in Nashville. I know I told you during the funeral. Yeah, I was in Nashville. No, not Nashville, at the motel. Houston. Yeah, Houston. Uh, God's doing something in spite of what everybody thinks nowadays. The young people's not getting touched by God, but I know God's raising up a new crew. So I'm glad that God's moving. I'm glad these two men came up to St. Louis, followed up yeah. and up here and had a revival. So if you would, bow your head with me. Let's go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, God, I thank you, God, for a time of meeting together, Father. And Lord, I ask you for one thing, that your anointing would fall down upon this place, my God. Lord, whatever you have in store for me, God, in this place, Lord, let me receive it, God. Bless these men, God. Bless this congregation, God. And bless the song, service, and preaching. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Brother Harry, sit us happy, God. How many is glad to be in the house of God? Amen. You know, uh, coming up, you always, you know, wonder what's going to happen in revival. It's, but like you were saying, the Lord's on the move. And the Lord's on the move with the younger generation, but it means Amen. us that are just a little bit older, we need to catch on yeah. up. We need to carry on with them and march right beside them. Yeah. Hallelujah. I got a little drummer out here. I have trouble keeping up with the beat. Well, the rhythm of the day can be open. Let's join the wind tonight. I've got the joy, the joy down in my heart. Because Jesus made everything right.
depth of this song was just a song of encouragement that God gave to me, and I just wrote it down and I wanted to share. It goes like this. As she gets off the phone, hoping not to go alone, with a Bible in her hand, she makes a choice to be with friends or to go. Just say that revival. But now she knows what it takes to be a Christian in this world today. There's a price she pay. I'm going on for Jesus. I'm going on the way. I'm going on for Jesus. In his hands I am the clay. Hold me, shake me, empower me with your anointing. All for Jesus, he may return in a day. Seventeen, and searching. Somewhere between a boy and a man Don't understand just what it means How do I walk with God in the streets of this world? Temptation lying everywhere Where do I go? I'm going on for Jesus I'm going on the way I'm going on for Jesus in his hands I am the clay. Hold me, shake me, empower me with your anointing. All for Jesus, you may return in your day. Do that second verse again. Seventeen and searching. Somewhere between a boy and a man Don't understand just what it means How do I walk with God in the streets of this world? Temptation lying everywhere Where do I go? I'm going on for Jesus I'm going on the way I'm going on for Jesus in his hands I am the clay. Mold me, shake me, empower me with your anointing. All for Jesus, he may return in a day. Lord, I long to see your face. As a sing of your amazing grace. Lord, I long to see your face As I sing of your amazing grace There is one day in your course. There is one. 
worship you, my God. We lift you up, my God. I can only imagine what it would be like when I walk by your side. I can only imagine when all I do is forever, forever worship you. I can only imagine. Surrounded by your glory, what will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus? Oh, no, will I miss them? Will I stand in your presence? To my knees, will I fall? Will I sing? Hallelujah, will I be able to speak at all, but I can only imagine, I can only imagine. I can only imagine when that day will come, then I find myself. Standing in the sun, I can only imagine all that I will do when I'm there. Forever worship you, I can only imagine.
But it's God's spirit. It always brings out. He always gives us a victory. So I just thank God for that. Amen. That's the one thing I think the, the, the longer I've been in this thing myself, I thought the older I got, the more I got into it, the more closer I'd be or less fleshy I'd be. But I found out the older I'm getting, the more fleshier I'm getting. <laughs> Because we, we, we tend to listen. I thank God for a feeling. There's nothing like a feeling. If anybody says they don't like them, then there's something wrong with them. But he says we walk by faith and not by sight. And unfortunately, it's good when we feel the feeling of God, but when everything's going wrong, that's when our faith that has to activate. You know? Yeah. And I thank God that we can get to a place that if we believe even when we don't feel like she's saying that God can do something. Amen. So faith. Uh, these boys... Dewey came from Louisiana, and uh, brother came from about 80 miles away, Harry Allen, and the, the, I didn't even know they was coming until the night before last when they called me, but they never asked me, but I think it would be nothing but right to take up a little offer for them. If you've got something to give, great. If you don't, let the Lord get into your heart. But I want to give them a little something. They didn't come up here for money. I, I, I truly think it's something, knowing that... A couple of men would take out their time. No, there ain't a whole lot of people up here right now, but still will come up and try to bless us and think enough to think about us. So uh, if you got a little something, just pass this around. Like I said, let the Lord lead you on that. Lord bless this offering and sanctify in Jesus' name. Now, does anybody have a song? <laughs> I bet you got one. Oh, I, 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 <laughs> anybody got a song? Do anybody else got a song? No? Harry, I'm going uh, to cut it back over to you if you want to sing or go ahead and preach whatever you feel that to do. And let God touch our hearts here tonight. Give him a hand as he comes. It almost feels like I just sat down. <laughs> I want to thank uh, each and every one of you for coming out tonight, for uh, coming for the break bed with the gospel, break bread with the gospel. Brother, uh, Jackman called me and uh, encouraging me. I've been coming in on revival and he's been encouraging me, like uh, Bobby said, uh, to be on fire for the Lord. And uh, But it's always an honor and a privilege. I don't care who you are, where you are, where you're at. Just It's a privilege to be here at the house of God to lift up Jesus Christ, no man's yeah. name. Lift up Jesus Christ because it's never about any man. It's only about Jesus Amen. Christ. That's always about God. And, you know, that's who the glory is for. And that, who, you know, with reverence and, you know, you have honor to. And uh, it's it's always an honor to be a part. And whether you're <coughs> ministering, you're singing, you know, or, or you're just attending, like you're, you're a part. You're a part of that body of Christ. Mm -hmm. and, and we're all in it together. Mm -hmm. Amen. Um, uh, let's, uh, just to announce, too, I guess we're going to be doing our services at 7 o'clock every night over the next uh, few nights, and we're going to have Saturday at 12, I guess we're agreeing on that, uh, the 12 a.m. noon time and stuff like that. So tonight, 7, tomorrow, 7, uh, Saturday, we'll have a noon service and a uh, 7 o'clock service, so like that way. So that way, Sundays, everyone go to their own church like that. We're not wanting to interfere with any of that. We just want to come and break bread in the time that we can. Uh, and tomorrow night, Brother Yubi Stewart will be ministering the word. So come uh, looking and expecting and I invite somebody to come on out. Um, I'm going to take scripture from tonight in Isaiah chapter 5, verses, uh, chapter 5, verses 20 through 23. If you have your Bible with you today. I just happen to have mine because I'm preaching. Chapter 5, verses 20 through 23. I'll hit through a little scriptures. I, I got a little bit. I'm going to try to get through as uh, quickly as I can because I know we started a little late. And uh, I brought a lot because um, I'm a slab. I, I talk a lot. For no reason. That'd be good. But, uh, but this isn't my talk and this isn't for anything like that. We're just here to talk my God. Isaiah chapter 5, verses 20 through 23, and uh, I'll read from the scripture. It says, Woe to them that call evil good, and good evil, that put darkness for light, and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet, and sweet for bitter. 
Woe to them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. Woe to them that are mighty to drink wine and men of strong to mingle strong drink, which justify the wicked for reward and take away the righteousness of the righteous from him. Let us pray for a moment, Father. Thank you, Father, for this night, for an opportunity to minister the gospel of Jesus Christ. Father, I pray that you water my mind, water this word, and minister to all of us, including me, my God. Give us your word, teach us and guide us, in Jesus' name. Amen. The, the title of this message uh, is The Upside Down World, The Upside Down Way. And the reason for it is because it seems like that's all I see anymore is a completely upside down world. Everything that I see in this world is the good things are called evil. Evil things are called good. What, what is good for mankind, we, we throw away. And what's horrible for us, we embrace. And I wanted to go through a few things. In this scripture, it's such a blatant twist, a manipulation of the way the devil takes things and manipulates through men and they, they twist the way we perceive this world. And they not only twist it for themselves, but they'll twist others to see this world in an upside down way, which makes this into an upside down world. And uh, this is part one, and if I minister again like that, there'll be part two onto this, because there's plenty to talk about in an upside down world. The first thing I'm going to talk about is going back into the scripture. It says, Woe to them that are mighty to drink wine, and men of strength to mingle strong drink. The first thing to cause, you know, that the scripture points out to cause a twisted mindset is something to alter your mindset. Whether it be drink or any kind of substance that will alter the way you think. That will alter the way you see reality and see this world. And there's plenty of things out there to do these things. We've even felt, or I'm saying we, there is a rehab belt in Texarkana because of this. Because our people has taken on so much mind-twisting substances that people can't cope with reality anymore. It's like they, they see the world in such an upside-down way that it don't even make sense anymore. They can't cope with reality anymore. I have a friend, a gorgeous friend down where I live at. His name is Jesse. And uh, he would often mess with different things and between smoking and other things and stuff like that. And he was always telling me about a son that he had been estranged from. The, the child was whatever, three, four, five years old and they got divorced and moved away. And he's long to been with this child since. He's paid, you know, his dues and stuff like that and stuff like that, but he's never got to see this child in 14 or 15 years. And he's just always longed for it and he'd be sad and depressed and he would take these substances and alter his mind to try to cope with that, but it just was making the world upside down to him and he was mad at the world and everything. And I would start to talk to him about the Lord. I said, you know, God can turn this around. You know, I can't like look out and say, here, do X, Y, Z and this will make it around. But I know God knows a way and put your faith and trust in him. Amen. Well, one day he decides to take enough drugs that he puts himself in the hospital almost over these and kills himself. But still, God was not only faithful to prevent him from dying and to save his life, and they had written him off. But God not only gave him his life back, but the son, now an older young man, heard about it, and he come down to him. And God restored in a situation that was bleak, God restored that relationship between a father and a son. And, and seeing him go through these things, he, he was a heavy smoker. He, I saw them pump the stuff out of his lungs because when he was trying to you know, re, you know, re, get him going every which way, it was so black I could have sealed the driveway with it. That's how much smoking cigarettes and what he had in his lungs. And I thought, Surely he's seen the glory of God. Surely he's seen the grace of God. He, he's seen what God has done for him and restored the relationship and given him his life back and he's getting the full bill of health and his relationship with his son. But it wasn't a couple of weeks and I walked over to his place and here he is, smoking a cigarette. Now I'm not trying to condemn one thing like that, you know, because all, all is sin and falling short of the glory of God. But I mean, why did he go back? 
Why did he go back into this upside down reality? Why did he go back into this upside down world? But you see, there, there's, if you watch the television, if you talk with people, they will make you think that a drug will calm your nerves. You know, it seems like the people who got who takes something to calm their nerves got the worst nerves of them all. It, it's is we're going after these things, and it twists our mindset. It, it, it's supposed to calm our nerves, but it, it isn't helping. It's people. I've heard people say, if I can get a hold of a little something, then I can go out and get a job, and you know, I can. I'll knock the doors down. Then I, I mean, I'm gonna just 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 tear it up. I'll make show you some money then. But they're looking for the drug, and I can tell you, I've, I've lived long enough to, to, to see my young friends who've grown up to be men, and not one person has a drug ever helped them out over the long run. Amen. It's always brought them down. Uh, they might be able to handle it for a while, but sooner or later, there's that down point. But I've seen Jesus Amen. take people with nothing and turn them around and give them hope and joy and peace. And that's what I'm ministering tonight. I'm not here to bash anybody on the head about anything but to tell about what God has is better. Amen. What God has is so much better than this world has, but it's hard to see because this world is twisted and upside down. You turn on the television and there's a beer commercial and there's this commercial and you hear stories, all this drug humor going on and it sounds like a big joke and a big game and it sounds like all fun and games, but when you go out in the reality, these people's lives are destroyed. Their homes are destroyed, and, but they don't want to show that on television. They want to give you a twisted view. What is called good is actually evil, and the evil things is called good. Or it, it's it's all backwards and forwards. Even like I just busted up there. But you know where I'm going at. Amen. We go from drugs. If anyone knows anything about me, and especially if you're a Facebook friend of mine, and you know I like to talk about politics, and God help you. Hopefully, at the end of this election, I'll. <laughs> but we're a nation that's in war, but we don't realize it. It's like we're in war, but it's like something that's on the back news, and we don't pay attention to it, and we don't realize that people are leaving this country, fighting people in other nations, and dying so we can have our freedom here. And it's going on, and it's been going on for a long time. Now, I understood, you know, as any American on 9-11, when the terrorists hit the Twin Towers, and they hit the Pentagon, and it was taken down in that Pennsylvania field uh, that uh, Todd Beamer, and then they took that plane down. Now, we was at war with a man named Osama bin Laden and a terrorist organization called Al-Qaeda that wanted America, frankly, destroyed. Okay, and then we went to a place called, uh, called Afghanistan, and there was another group called the Taliban that is supporting them, another terrorist organization. So we went to war with them, and I understood it. But then we went to war with another nation. And we're trying to, why are we fighting them? And then we're fighting another nation. And then I'm, we're fighting them. But thank God we finally you know, brought Osama bin Laden to an end. And we got so much information on the Al-Qaeda group that we brought them down. They're still around, but I mean, they're, they're devastated. But we're still fighting. And we're talking about invading more countries. And what happened to peace? There, during one of the political debates, we had a debate last night that I've heard people talking about, but earlier on, there was a debate where one man stood up and said, with our foreign policy and dealing with wars and stuff, he says, we need to take on a golden rule. In Matthew chapter 7, verse, uh, chapter 7, verse 12, it speaks a golden rule. We, we know, frankly, to do unto others is you to have others do unto you. I mean, I, that's a paraphrase in the scripture, but that's basically the idea. And he said, I think we need in foreign policy to have a golden rule, to do unto other nations that we'd have them do unto us. And the crowd started booing them. And I was like, oh, this is upside down. Because this was supposed to be a Republican debate. This was supposed to be Christians in the southern state. Why are they booing the golden rule? Why are they booing something that Jesus ministered at the Sermon on the Mount? What's going on here? What is going on in this country and what's going on in this world that things are twisted upside down? And as I keep teach, I mean, keep learning about these things, did, I did not know, but a couple of years ago, we gave $1 billion to the Taliban since we've been fighting them. Why? Why aren't we giving money to people we're at war with? We are giving aid to Al-Qaeda in Syria. So in some nations we're fighting Al-Qaeda, and in another nation we're giving them weapons. And this is an upside-down world. 
and I don't understand it. This world makes no sense. Why are we doing things? Why do we borrow billions of dollars from China and then turn around and give them millions of dollars in aid? I mean, if, aren't we the ones needing it if we're borrowing it? Why are we borrowing money to turn around and give it back to them, just to pay them the money back? This world is making no sense. Something's desperately wrong in the logic of this world. And if it's not bad enough that we're over and we're killing in other nations, and the Ten Commandments it says, Thou shalt not kill, but we somehow twisted in our mind that it's okay for a mother to kill her own baby while it's in the room. And we've somehow twisted this in our mind that this is okay. This is an okay thought to do this. This is, you know, considerable, you know, this is an option. This is a choice. Where did killing an unborn baby, which is still human, just, just as much as any of us, we was all in that place at one time. Amen. When did this become okay? When did we allow our minds to be so twisted that we could kill our own children? Mm -hmm. There's a, there was a story that I read that was made a great illustration to, to people that who believe in this choice. Uh, there was a father, a really sickly man. There was a father, and he had a wife who had tuberculosis. Okay, they had four children. The first child they had that was born came out blind. The second child died. The third child came out deaf, and the fourth child came out and had tuberculosis. And then she finds out she's pregnant again. Now, a lot of people in this day would say, you know what, maybe you should abort that child. Maybe that child isn't worth, you know, maybe save it from suffering, you know, save it from a hard life ahead of it. But if you would have done that, you would have aborted Beethoven, because he was the fifth child of that family. We don't realize what we're doing when we're eliminating our own, our own people. I don't get that, and you know, I, 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 hope, I don't know really what more to say about that. Where do we come up with this? How can an evil thing becoming a murdering your own child become a good thing? And wanting to protect that child's life is now an evil thing. And it's a bigoted view. When did this happen? When did were those that call good things evil? And I'm sad to say, and I, I, I feel bad saying this, because I have to point the finger at myself, because we're allowing this. 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ came, and he shined a great light on this world. He said, this is the right way. This is it. And it's our job as Christians, not just as ministers, but as Christians, to shine a light, to go out and be a light to God for these people. To, to show the right way for this world. And we become defeatists. We've got all into our end time frenzy that we've all but laid down into a, a hole and died. I, I don't get it. There's, uh, there's two doctrines called Arminianism and Calvinists. Okay, Arminians, I'm not talking about Soviet Armenia being a person from that country. There's people that believe that we have free will. And I'm one of those people. That we have free will to accept God or to reject God. Amen. Then you have another people called Calvinists that says that we were built like that chair for a reason or purpose. And we really, we might think we have a choice, but we don't. We were created and we're going to heaven or hell just because that's the way God created us. We really don't have a say in this at all. Mm -hmm. And that's not what my Bible says. My Bible says to confess and believe in God. Right. And he would, that all would be saved. So I believe God, even though God is so much higher than my intellect could ever figure out. We have a choice in this matter. But we've gotten so much into end times prophecy. We've gotten so much into the end times that every time we hear something about abortion or war or the drug use, it's like we're like, oh, it's the end. I give up. It's just another sign of the end. It's over with. Jesus is coming back anytime, so let me just sit here and wait. Any moment now. Look our eyes towards heaven. There's a huge doctrinal difference that I have on these people because when anyone who calls himself an Arminian who believes in free will and starts doing this, they're acting like a Calvinist. They're acting like they don't have a choice. They don't have a fight in the matter. The spirit of Antichrist in 1 John, I believe, chapter 4, says it was here back in the days of the first disciples. The spirit of Antichrist, not the actual Antichrist, but his spirit, his doctrine. And we see it very evident today in atheism. 
It's very much that we're going to deny the existence of Jesus Christ, deny that Jesus came in the flesh. That's in 1 John chapter 4. This spirit of atheism has been here all this time, and we can not let it just continue to run over and act like we're silly for believing in God. They come up with these arguments that they'll say are logical arguments. They'll say, give me empirical evidence for the existence of God. Show me God like I got to see this tape. Okay, this, this cup, silly analogy, but this cup somewhere was made by a man. It might, it might have been made by a machine, but the man made the machine that made this cup. So somewhere there's a man responsible for this cup. Okay, how silly would it be for me to look for the man that made this cup inside the cup? I see no man, therefore no man who created this cup exists. That makes no sense. Well, my Bible says in the beginning, which is the beginning of time, God created the heavens, which is space, and the earth, dry ground, for which is matter. That's time, space, and matter, and God created all three in 1-1 of Genesis, which tells me that if God creates time, space, and matter, then he exists somewhere outside of time, space, and matter. This universe to God is no more than this cup is to me. And to look for the man inside this cup is so like looking for God in this universe. Now, I'm not saying I believe in the omnipresence of God, but there's, there's things called, uh, God help me, uh, there's a theory where energy can either be created, the first law of thermodynamics, energy cannot be created or destroyed. Basically, what it's saying throughout the universe, if you cause something to blow up, that energy radiates and goes off in other places. The energy actually never stops. You can't create energy because when you create energy, you're taking energy from something to make energy. So it's a constant cycle of balance, a perfect balance of energy. And I'm like, well, isn't that evidence for God right there? I mean, God throughout to never allow anything to be permanently destroyed. You know, this, this universe isn't deteriorating. It isn't, like, it might be going out in space farther, but it isn't increasing in energy. We're in a constant state. I didn't mean to go off into all of that. I'm just meaning that we're here today, and we can stand for the truth. And we don't have to look and say, Okay, the Antichrist is coming because from what I get in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3 through 7, let me just read that real quick. Because I kind of went off on a ramble and I, I think I even left myself behind there. <laughs> 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and it starts in verse 3. It says, Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. That would be the Antichrist. This is the scripture a lot of people believe. There's going to be a falling away. Antichrist will be revealed. But if you go down to verse 7, it says, For the mystery of iniquity does already work. Only he who now lets will let until he be taken out of the way. And in verse 8 it says, And then shall the wicked be revealed. In other words, the wicked can't be revealed until something gets taken out of the way. Now, in the, through the Full Gospel Fellowship of America, and like that, and I personally believe doctrinally that that is talking about the Holy Spirit or the Holy Spirit being in us. And this event it's talking about being taken out of the way is what we call the rapture. That can happen at any time, at any moment, right now. That's what we're looking at on our script, scriptural clock, so to speak, our spiritual clocks. First, the church got to be taken out of the way, then the Antichrist be revealed. So in other words, if I'm with the Lord and I get taken out, then the Antichrist comes in. That means I'm not going to be here when the Antichrist is here. I'm not going to meet the Antichrist. I'm not going to have a conversation with I'm not going to have to deal with the Antichrist. In fact, i got to be taken out of the way before it can be revealed. Now, I'm a hindrance to the spirit of Antichrist. And that's what God called us to be. Whether we are in 1st century A.D. or 21st century A.D., we're to go out and be a hindrance, to preach the gospel and to shine this light. Not to be defeatist and waiting around for God to come and say, everything that goes wrong is just a sign of the end and a time to give up. It's time that we stand. In fact, it's, now is more of a time for us to stand harder than ever before. And let us stand until we are taken out. When God takes time in God's own time, let us do what we're supposed to do and let God do what God's supposed to do. Amen? It's so important because in Mark chapter 9, and I'm going to read the scripture, and I'm getting towards the end here. 
Mark chapter 9. It's uh, verses 43 through 48. We're going to minister this, minister this gospel to the ends of the earth. And once we minister to the ends of the earth, it doesn't say this in the Bible, but I guess we should just keep on ministering until the ends of the earth. Well, let's just keep on ministering and some more. TBN used to have this thing that coast to coast and around the world that it was beaming satellite strip, you know, of, uh, of constant Christianity, constant ministry being beaming down like people with satellites so they could watch 24-7, 365, Jesus being preached around the world. Well, let's just keep doing it and keep doing it until God takes us out from doing it. Let's just keep doing what we were built and created to do. Let's, let's minister the gospel. In Mark chapter 9, reading through verse 43 through 48, it says that if your hand offends you, cut it off. It is better for you to enter into life main than to have two hands to go into hell and to the fire that never shall be quenched. Where the worm never die, or where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. And if your foot offends you, cut it off. It's better for you to enter, uh, in, uh, enter halt into life than to have two feet and be cast into hell, into the fire that shall never be quenched, where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. And if your eye offends you, pluck it out. It's better for you to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than to have, having two eyes and be cast into hell fire, where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Now these are the words of Jesus. This isn't a doctrine. This is a direct quote from Jesus. First of all, that there is a hell. And from what I understanding, we don't want to go there. That's an understatement of the universe. A lot of people believe that this is a fear tactic. This is no more a fear tactic than for someone to say you need to wear your seatbelt because if you're in a wreck, you're more likely to have a fatal accident than not if you're not wearing your seatbelt. You know, that's, that's not a fear tactic. That's know that what you're getting into. And if you walk out of here without Jesus Christ in your heart and in your soul as your Lord and Savior, then you stand at risk that if you die, you're going to face this fire and torment. Now, it says some very extreme things. It cut off your hand. It cut off your foot. Pluck out your eye. Now, it's not meaning that God wants us to go around and do these things. It means that there should be nothing so sacred in your life that you're not willing to give it up for God. Nothing. Not even your hand. Not even your eye. Not even your foot. Nothing should be so sacred in your life that you're not willing to give it up for God. I want everyone in here to just, just shut your eyes for a moment. That this is kind of an odd thing. But the Lord told me, or laid it on my heart to do this. I'm going to ask you probably to do probably what the most horrifying thing a person could ever imagine. Imagine that you just died and you found yourself in hell. And here you are surrounded by the fire and the flames. And you hear screams of torment. And there's one thing on your mind and one thing only, to get out. To get out of this place. It's nothing but torture, every misery. There's no love there. There's no courage. There's no joy. There's no peace. All there is is torment. All there is is pain. All there is is suffering. Jesus told a parable about a man who, uh, who had at the gate named Lazarus and a rich man. And the rich man died and Lazarus died and he went to hell. And the rich man kept trying to get them to send Lazarus back to life to talk to people and tell them about Jesus and tell them to avoid this place. Now, everybody open your eyes. You've been given the greatest gift of all time. You was in hell, but now you're here. And you have a chance to give your life to God. And anything that you was holding on to your life, wanting that was keeping you from God, you have an opportunity now to not let this, that thing send you to hell, but to get rid of it. And get it out of your life. My brother, here we come to the music. No, it's, it's okay. I'm just, I'm not going to beg or plead or borrow. But, but this is it. Uh, you know, I'm doing the altar call. In fact, everybody stand up because I know everyone's been sitting down for a while. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We've all made it. We've all done it. I don't care who it is in here, we've all done it. So there's no one in here can that could judge someone else and point a finger at anyone else because we've all sinned. But you know what? 
2,000 years ago, Jesus died for each and every one of us. Amen. He had that love and compassion for us to save us from that hell, to save us from that torment. And not only that, in this life, see, this world has this twisted, upside-down view that it, it, it's, it's about things, about worldly things. It's about the way the world sees you. But God can give you joy in your heart. Amen. Whether you have a lot or you have a little. He can give you peace in your heart. Whether you have a lot or you have a little. He can give you a love that this world it makes no sense. In fact, this world will call you a Bidian for, for having this love for people and this compassion for people. But I just want to ask if there's anyone here tonight that doesn't know Jesus Christ as a personal Lord and Savior, or if the Lord is laying it on their heart, they don't understand, but God is just doing this to their heart and just saying, come down to that altar. Now is your opportunity to come down and then we'll pray with you. We'll pray through the sinner's prayer that Jesus Christ, that you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. And whatever it is that's in your life, to repent from it, to turn away from it. Repenting from it doesn't mean you're saying you're sorry and then it's okay now. That, that seems to be a, a, new, a new fad. But to repent, repent means to turn away and leave it behind you. You're, that, that was the old man. That was the old woman. That was a person that you was before, but you're not anymore. But now you are a new man in Jesus Christ. You are a new woman in Jesus Christ. I want to give you that opportunity. I'm going to just, uh, just sing nothing but the blood of Jesus one more time. And I'll turn it back over to Bobby. This altar is open. Don't let the moment pass. <coughs> There's nothing worth missing, missing heaven over. Nothing. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus And what can make me whole again Nothing but the blood of Jesus Oh, precious is the that makes me white as snow, no other fountain I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus, this is all.
moment pass you by. The Spirit of God is here for you. Bring God your troubles. Bring God your worries. Bring God your cares. He cares for you lots. He cares for you like more than any brother or sister or mother or father, daughter, son, any family, any friend. God is there for you. He cares for you. Everything that uh, all the blessing that I received and everybody else has got it, my God. 